Today is July 24th, 2007. I am Jessica Clark. It is a pleasure to conduct this interview for the Dakota Memories Oral History Project mm -hmm. in Bismarck, North Dakota. To start with, can you please state your full name? Stanley Helbing being the full name. And where were you born, Stanley? Mandan, North Dakota. And when were you born? Where? When? 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 3, 4, 16. Did you ever hear a story about your birth? Not really. They didn't discuss that much. Can you share with us one of your earliest childhood memories? Oh, dear. I just don't know. Uh, we uh, lived in the Scandinavian neighborhood, and we contacted them a lot, and I uh, understood a number of words in Swedish and, and Norwegian, but... Uh, uh, I don't remember a lot of details of that. Uh, I suppose when I was about five, I'd get acquainted with the neighborhood and they'd be there frequently. And uh, my dad uh, didn't speak English very well. And uh, so uh, that's how it went then. You had to just figure out what was said or what to say, you know. So did you actually grow up in the town of Mandan? Well, on the farm, okay. all on the farm. It's 20 miles southwest of Mandan, yeah. Was Mandan the closest town? Well, St. Anthony was a small village. Uh, we went to church there, and uh, we, they had a couple of grocery stores there and a gas station. So we used that just one Sunday, so when we went to church, you'd probably take some gas or whatever. But other than that, we did our shopping in Mandan. We were 20 miles from that, yeah. So did, how would you get to Mandan? We, uh, at that time, uh, when I grew up, we just had horse and buggy. Uh, I would help to haul grain to town with a wagon. Sometimes we would go with three wagons to haul grain to town. And uh, if we went to church, we used a buggy, and that had a double seat, and we'd go to church with a, with a buggy on, on Sunday, you know. And it didn't have a top on it, it was just open. Yeah. How did you stay warm? Uh, on the well, in the winter time, you would bundle up good, and if it's very cold, you didn't go. You know, uh, like I tell some people, how do you keep warm? And I say, well, I put on a coat, and if it's very cold, I button it. You know, it's, so that's what, what we did. You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that you grew up in a Scandinavian area. Were there other German Russians around? There were, well, they were more to the east, but uh, we were the only one in that immediate area, you know, uh, Scandinavians all around. We liked them. We uh, got along well with them. They were good neighbors. I enjoyed them very much. Yeah. So when you went to school, were most of the kids Scandinavian then? Yeah, most of them were. Our, ours were German. There was a Langang family. They were, they, they were German. And there was a Schmidt family. They, they had German kids. And uh, the rest were Scandinavian, the, the Rasks and the Johnsons and, and uh, Swanbergs, I guess. They were Scandinavian, they were Swedish, but good people. I liked them very much. What was the um, religion? What was the pro predominant religion? Well, the religion was Lutheran for those people. Ours was Catholic, of course. Uh, but all those Scandinavians, they were Lutherans. Yeah. Time then, did the Lutherans and the Catholics socialize together? Oh, sure. Picnics or whatever, yeah. School picnics and such. Yeah, we got along fine together. Um, you mentioned, uh, you talked a little bit about what was in St. Anthony's. Do you remember about how big the community was? Oh, well, St. Anthony probably had, they might have had 50 people, I would guess. And how about Mandan? When you were growing up, what was in Mandan? Well, they had grocery stores and ele green elevators and and uh, things mm -hmm. like that. You could buy all your your clothing that you needed. It was there for you, and uh, that's where we hold our grain in the fall. And uh, we would stock up on groceries in Mandan. It was cheaper than St. Anthony. It was a little bigger place. Yeah. One thing that sticks in my mind: I was probably sixteen or seventeen. My father ran out of hay, so then he bought hay from my uncle, and I had to go there and work a month to work that hay, that because we got that hay, so someone's got to work for that. So it was me, and for spending money one Sunday, I got a dime. 
<laughs> you don't forget those things, you know. <laughs> so what could you buy for a dime back then? Just an ice cream bar or something like that. <laughs> or a candy bar, that's about all. How often would you get up to Mandan when you were growing up? Oh, not too often. Uh, when they go to town with the tall cream to town at that time, uh, we did a lot of milking, so the cream had to be hauled in once or once in two weeks or something. And sometimes one of us got to go along, and if you did, you might have got a nickel or a dime to spend. That was it. And uh, uh, they had uh, they had to haul that cream in, and the cream cans would be full after a period of time. And that was their uh, spending money for repairs and, uh, and clothes and whatever, you know. That was our source of income during the summer. Yeah. So when the parents were doing the shopping and stuff, what would the kids do in Mandan? Well, we wouldn't all go. Maybe one or two of us went. And we were 13 in the family, you know. And uh, we had to uh, see three sets of children in our family, you know, because uh, when my mother died, I was two years old. And I had two brothers left. And they were, they were halblings, three of us halblings. And my dad remarried later to a lady that had two children. Their name, family name was Knoll. So now we were five boys and all under six. <laughs> it was, I guess it wasn't easy for a mother to take care of them. And anyway, then they had, then they had eight children, this marriage, you know. And uh, there were 13 and 13 of us together. And I was the youngest of the five boys that were together, you see. I was two years old. But when they got married, well, then uh, I had four of them older than I, you know. But, but totally we were 13 children. So can you, can you list them in, the, in their age order so that I know who, how, their names? Well, yeah. Now, some are, some are separate, separate. Joe, Joe was, uh, let's, say, let's say that Joe was six. And Pete was four, John was three, Amy was, well, Amy was, uh, I, I was only two, so, well, John and Amy were close together. Their ages almost doubled, you know, at the same time. So, uh, Amy and uh, John were, let's say, uh, two, and I was, no, no, they was three and I was two, yeah. And, of course, the girls then came along, and they, uh, I suppose they were married maybe a year or whatever, and they, they had six girls and two younger boys. And what are their names? What's that? What are their names? Oh, now, the, the oldest girl was Magdalene, and then Bertha, Monica, Mary, and Jenny, and Hildegard. There should be six there, I think. And then there was two younger boys. Uh, they would have been, Alfred was born in 32, and Tommy was born in 30, 1930. What was it like growing up in a, in a family of 13? We were just used to it. They came a little at a time. We were just exposed. I did a lot of babysitting. Uh, many times I did babysitting. I took care of the baby, and I, I was the youngest of the boys, so I was the one that stayed in the house and did a lot of things, even do some dishes probably. And someone had to do it with that family, you see. And as I got older, of course, I was exposed to the milking. Did all, we all had our chores. I'd be milking maybe four or five cows, and someone else would do the same. We probably milked about 15 or 16 cows. And we had our milk and cream, and we had our, our, uh, our meat, because we butchered hogs and the beef. We were not lacking for food. We had, lot, we had no money, but we had a lot of good food to eat. Can you tell me a little bit about the the butchering, like what you guys would do for butchering? Okay, we would uh, butcher probably four or five hogs during the winter, usually during the winter months. My dad would be the guy that would stick the hogs, hogs into the <laughs> chest to get the heart and then they bleed to death, that's how it goes. But we had to sit on them and hold them while they do that. And then they squeal, of course, pretty soon the squeal quit and, and then we'd get them ready to we had a, 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 a container, we called it a kind of a trough-like thing to put scalding water in and scald that hog, you know, and then the hair come off real easy. We had scrapers to scrape all those hair off the hog and you have nothing but the bare skin. So that was part of our job, you know. And then, of course, uh, my dad would hang this hog up 
in the barn on, uh, between a couple of rafters or whatever you want to call it. And from there, they would draw it in the inside. And, um, and then, of course, we'd leave that hang and get the next hog. We usually kill for two or three hogs at one time to make it worthwhile, I guess. And our meat, to process it, we would cut it and it goes into barrels with brine. You see, we've cured our own meat. But my dad would uh, open those hogs and he'd drop the insides. And I had to help to carry that out for the coyotes out in the country, out in the pasture or whatever. And uh, we made our own casings, though, for sausage. You know, we cleaned them out. You drain them and drain them and use a lot of water to rinse them. Then you turn them inside out. And uh, so uh, what was cleaned out would be on the outs outside, see. And uh, that's how it went on. And we did that. Uh, Oh, we probably butchered, I would say, three times during the winter, maybe two or three hogs each time. And we had our supply of food. We had sausage, we had ham, we had bacon, whatever you needed. We killed the beef. And there was no, no shortage of food, but money we had very little. That was scarce in the, in the 30s especially. You know, something that I've heard a little bit about um, when, with butchering is like blood sausage or liver sausage uh -huh. and head yeah. cheese. Did you guys? We made all that. We how, made. How would you do those type of things? Well, we would. Uh, the the head was used for for blood sausage. You know the the big cheeks on the hog, and and maybe some of the belly they cut off, and uh, also for the liver sausage we used the liver, and also some of the head. Well, we had killed three hogs, so you had a, enough of everything, and we saved the blood when we stick that hog. You save that blood and then you add that to the ground up meat that you made blood sausage with, see? And then you add that blood with it and it was all right to use as it was. And with the liver sausage, we'd add the liver. We'd cook, we'd boil that, and then we'd grind it fine and uh, use some of the other meat along with it from the head, like the, the red meat, we'll say. We'd cook that, grind it all together, and mix it for liver sausage. And the rest then, uh, there's a lot of stuff comes off there when you trim it, and that goes into regular country-style sausage. So we made a lot of those every time. And of course, they had to be smoked after they were made, you see. So we did that. Did you have a smokehouse on your farm? Oh, yeah, we had a smokehouse, huh? Yeah, we used, uh, oh, some oak was preferred to use for smoking. Sometimes they even used straw for sausage a little bit. That clean straw was all right, too. What about head cheese? Did you make head cheese? Uh, well, that, yeah, we made that too, head cheese. Uh, that was uh, meat from the head quite a bit. And uh, nobody else went in. A lot of <laughs> skin, some skin went in and some red meat. Now, my dad liked it. I didn't like head cheese at that time. I could eat it now, but I'd have better meat in there. But you use that meat as not too desirable, I would say. And my dad liked a lot of fat in there too, so we never liked it, head cheese. Uh, they, they called it, in German, they called it Schwadebacher. <laughs> what was that again? Schwadebacher, meaning skin from the, from the hog. And that went into the head cheese. Yes, you know, some, some skin, a few, a few uh, straps of skin was ground up and, and put in. And that was head cheese. And, yeah. What about um, other animals that you would butcher on the farm? What else did you have on the farm? Well, we had a lot of chickens that we'd butcher, and they would can some of those if you butcher any amount. You, you had to can them. You had no freezer to keep them. You can't keep them on ice that long. So those we'd have to can. And, and even sometimes they'd can some sausage, too, to preserve them. You know, when you have no... We had ice, but you can't keep it that long. It's okay for a short time. You probably we keep our cream on ice, but you can't keep your beef on ice that long. You know, it would eventually spoil, I guess. So, did you have to help with the butchering of chickens? Oh yeah, so I butchered myself a lot of times. My mother would say, "You go out to catch two roosters and butcher them." Then I had to scald them and pull the feathers off, and she'd do the rest. <laughs> I did that a lot. It was just my chore, I think. Yeah, go butcher a couple of roosters. They'd be springers. They were good, good meat at that time, you know. They, you know, they weren't overgrown once. They probably weighed four or five pounds or something. So did your mother raise chickens on the farm? Always, always did. Chickens, turkeys, ducks, and geese. 
We always raise that stuff. So we had a variety of meat that was done in the fall, then we'd butcher one now and then in order to have that variety of meat. What about a garden? Did your mother have always, a garden? We always had a garden, always. Yeah, vegetables and, uh, and our own potatoes, of course. We had a potato field that, which I had to help to hoe all the time to keep it clean. Yeah, that was a regular assignment for us kids, you know, to hoe the garden, uh, the potatoes or the vegetables or whatever. You know. Were there a lot of bugs on the potatoes when you were growing up? A lot of what? Bugs. Did you have to, like, pick bugs off the potatoes? Oh, well, yeah, we had bugs? potato bugs. We could spray them. Uh, usually we spray them with, uh, I can't think of the name of the uh, uh, solution they used. Uh, uh, I, can't, I can't think of the name. It was a green solution. Of, you mix it with water and spray it. And to spray, we just had, we didn't have a sprayer. I don't think we used something to, that would sprinkle it uh, on there. And, uh, and uh, you'd get rid of the bugs after you. It would kill them when they chew on the, on the plant. And how about the, the garden? What type of vegetables did you guys grow? Well, of course, a common thing would be cabbage and beets, cucumbers. Uh, watermelon, uh, cantaloupe, that type of thing, and I can't think of, I can't think of all of it now. Pumpkins, that was a common thing. We uh, used that in the fall. We left them lay until fall and used them. Uh, and during the winter, we'd uh, we'd bake them. They make uh, they call it. Uh, I'll say it, we'll call it a pumpkin bar. In German, they call it Blechinga. Blechinga. And that was popular as well, well advertised and well used, you know. Did you like it? Oh, you bet. I, my wife has some froze now. Yeah, we make it in the fall and freeze it. And when we need some, she'll bake them. Yeah, she puts them away and freeze them while they're raw, you know. But in, in dough, you see, with pumpkin. Yeah, they were good. How about you, you had cabbage in your garden. Did your mother or your father make sauerkraut? Yeah, we did. They had a 15-gallon crock that they made sauerkraut with, and you'd have to tamp it in there, you know, with a, uh, out of a piece of fence post to made a stomper to, you had to pack it in. And whatever solution they put in, I'm not familiar, I suppose vinegar and salt, I suppose, it had to go with it. Uh, they made sauerkraut all the time. Of course, in later years, that was discontinued, you know, as they got older. Serve sauerkraut with when you were growing up? Oh, maybe spare ribs, pork ribs, and sauerkraut. That was common. And they had a, a dough dish too, some kind of a noodle, and they mixed that with sauerkraut, and that was popular. So, who did the cooking in your family? Well, my mother did, but the girls, when they were growing up, they all, they, the older ones helped, helped with the cooking. When you think back to your childhood, what are some of your favorite dishes that your mother used to make? Well, she had a lot of dough dishes, you know, and she made some of that maybe two or three times a week. And it was a simple thing to make. And I know she'd bake bread twice a week. It was a big family. And so you, and when you bake bread, you, you have that uh, deep fried bread, you might say, that they put in grease. And that was common and we liked it very much. And they have, uh, oh, I forget what they called all those, um, I can't think of it now. Anyhow, the little square piece of dough goes into the grease, hot grease, and it pops up, and they would uh, put powdered sugar on it, and, and we'd go for that. And also that fried bread, almost the size of a plate, they would put that deep fried in grease, and then when it comes out, they sprinkle regular sugar on it, and that goes over well with soup, you know. We had a lot of that stuff. So you liked anything with sugar on it? Well, pretty much. Not always, but, you know, we used sugar on that, you know. Were there any meals that you didn't like? Well, I'd get tired of some of those dough meals, you know, we'd have them so much. But uh, I liked meat meals and potatoes. Sausage, homemade sausage, we, we were great on them, you know. Liver sausage, or even the blood sausage. You know. It was common there to use that even for breakfast sausage, even in blood sausage, because you go out there and you work, you have work to do, and you, you want a big breakfast, you know. So that was common that we had that for breakfast. Growing up with 13 kids and um, two parents, did you guys 
eat all together your meals? All at one time. We had room at the table. They wanted to be in the high chair maybe, and there was always a baby around there. <laughs> Did you have um, an assigned place where you sit, like your place? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much so. Us boys had a bench in the back of the table, maybe held five boys, and us boys would sit on that. The rest were chairs. And we had some chairs that didn't have backs on them. Those days, you didn't go buy new furniture all the time. If the back was broke, you used it without a back. <laughs> that's, that's how it is. Was, was mealtime a quiet time, or would people yeah. be conversing? Yeah, they, they, you could talk, yeah. Yeah, they discussed a lot of things. Discussed our jobs for the day or whatever, you know, they'd explain. What about um, before you began a meal? Would you say a prayer? Always. Always before meals, yeah. Do you remember the prayer that you would say before? Well, not really. We said it in German. I couldn't say it. I wouldn't. We, we said it in German as we grew up. That was a habit, you know, that you say that prayer in German. But, of course, as we grew up, you, say, you have that regular one that we, we say. We forget it a lot of times now. <laughs> Let's see here. What about um, baths? How often would you take a bath when well, you were growing up? Well, lucky if you got it once a week with uh, you not having your bathroom. You know, we used the tub, a regular round tub to get in and take a bath. Late in the evening, the rest would go to bed. You'd take your bath, and you didn't. You didn't have bath water for every kid. You used the same bath water for some. You know, you had to. You didn't have enough water around there to change 13 times, let's say. Well, it's wrong when I say that because uh, as they were growing up, the little ones wouldn't need a bath that often. No, they'd give them their bath during the day and in the evening maybe we'd take hours uh, at bedtime or something. Where did you get the water from to bath, bathe in? It was carried down with cream cans and placed in the, in the uh, stove that had a... a, a, a container there to heat, heat water. We'd have hot water from that on the, on the uh, kitchen range, and that's uh, to heat our water. Since you didn't have a bathroom in the house, where was the bathroom? Outside, uh, the outhouse. We had an outhouse. You did, and for the little ones, they used to have pots for the little kids, you know. Of course, they couldn't go out, you know. And for us, that was outside, yeah. How far was that from the house? Oh, maybe 100 feet or so. Brushing your teeth was that something that it you wasn't did? common. It wasn't common. When we went to school, we finally got toothbrushes, but before then we didn't. And it, they were a little lax about that. Our parents didn't push it because they never did it themselves. You know, it was not a habit. But uh, I, I liked it, and most of us had toothbrushes, and we'd brush our teeth. Did you have toothpaste, or did you use something else? No, we had toothpaste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you go to see a dentist at all when you were a kid? Only when you had a bad tooth. <laughs> Not otherwise. You didn't get a checkup at all. Uh, I, I've had a broken tooth one time for a long time and finally it rotted off. And now it got to hurting and I had to go to the dentist. So I went in and there it was just a stub in there. And he got in and just broke them apart, you know. <laughs> it was not comfortable. That's how it was. If, if I had just a decayed tooth, they'd pay no attention to that. It had to be something serious before they'd take me to the dentist. You had that many kids, you know, you're not going to be hauling to the dentist very often. <laughs> yeah. What about glasses? Did you have to have glasses when you were a kid? No, I didn't get them until after I was married and I was probably 45 years old or something. None of them had glasses very, very young at all. Did you ever have to go to the doctor at all when you were a kid? Only if you got hurt bad, otherwise you didn't. There's no regular checkups there at all. That was not a habit. When you were growing up, did anybody on your on the farm get need to go to a doctor for any reason? Well, our mother went. She had uh, have surgery for gallstones, and my dad was in one time for appendix, and uh, I think some of the girls had the appendix operations. I didn't, but I think two of the girls had the appendix operations during that time. And it, very, it was very hard to pay the bills those days because you didn't have that money handy for that. I know from my mother, uh, when she was had their operation, I think that we got bills for almost a year until they finally got it cleaned up. You know, it was it was hard to pay. How far was the 
was the, the place where they would go for surgery? It, in Mandan, a, 20 miles, you know. Would they stay over then? If, like when your mother went up, would she stay over? Well, my, our grandpa lived in town, so they'd stay with them. Well, this was taking place, you know. They'd probably stay there a day or two, then they're going home again, and, and eventually our mother would be released, you know. You said your grandpa lived in town. What was his name? Valentine. And his dad's name was also Valentine. And was this your father's father? Yeah, yes. He had died at the age of 84, and he died in 1938. I remember that well. That's the year we got married, my wife and I, and he died that summer of 1938. Do you remember his funeral? Yes, I do. What was it like? Well, they had the coffin in the house, but I didn't get to the funeral because I... At that time, uh, I was working somewhere and I couldn't get to the funeral. But it was uh, quiet, mostly relatives, you see. And I think all the uh, six brothers were pallbearers. I had six uncles, and uh, they, uh, they were the pallbearers. Did you know, your, you, you know your grandfather while you were growing up? I stayed there one, one year for school uh, to make my first Holy Communion. We stayed at his place, all of us. The, the other one stayed at a boarding school at St. Anthony, but us boys stayed at my grandfather's house to, for one winter to get the education for, to make your Holy Communion. So that's how it was. So I was well acquainted with my father, and we were 10 blocks from church, and he, my grandfather walked it every day to go to church, no matter what the weather was like. And I walked to school from there, too. And there was not a thing. No such thing as staying home from school because it was snowing. You went to school, <laughs> you know. That was an order. When you think back to your childhood, how would you best describe your grandpa Valentine? Well, he was uh, slow and spoke almost no English, very little. He got along with the neighbors that that could speak English, and he, he learned a little from that. And he always raised a few chickens, uh, and that gave them their eggs every day, you know. Those days you could have chickens. We also had a cow, and the cow was brought in from our farm because I stayed there. That gave us the milk to use, and it had uh, made, you have your cream and butter. And uh, I even, uh, on my way to school, I would take uh, some milk and peddle it with some of the neighbors that uh, would buy a quart of that milk, and I'd have to peddle it on my way to school. That's what they did with the excess milk that they had. They didn't need it all. Yeah. I was a milkman, you might say, a milk boy. <laughs> what type of things would you do with your Grandpa Valentine when you were staying with him? You wouldn't really do anything with him. He was not much of a guy to uh, do anything with. <coughs> they were just all business about what they had to do, you know. <coughs> what about your grandmother? Well, my grandma died early in life. And my grandpa was married four times, and they all died before him. And uh, so I just knew them slightly, you know, because we didn't uh, stay there much then. And uh, the winter that I stayed there to, uh, to go to the Catholic school, uh, he had, uh, I think, uh, a relative of his, and my uh, uncle and aunt also stayed there. Uh, to do the cooking and, and everything. But uh, the the grandmas, I didn't get acquainted very well with them because they died before I was was staying in town. What about, okay, so this grandfather, did he come over from Russia? Oh yeah, they came over in, uh, in uh, 1893. And uh, my dad was born in, uh, in uh, 1888, and uh, he was only five years old. And uh, let's see, they came in 1893. Did your dad have any memories? Did he ever tell you if he had any memories of Russia? Or? Not much. My dad was five years old, so he uh, couldn't tell me too much. But I'd hear it from other older folks when they'd visit there, you know, I'd, I'd hear it from them. And they, they were hardships usually. They didn't have much of anything. Money was very scarce, and jobs were not very plentiful, you know. Your father, 
father, what was his name? Alfred. Alfred Helbling. Can you tell me a little bit about what he was like when you were growing up? Oh, he was, of course, the boss. And when something isn't right, he would make you do it right. <laughs> and he didn't have to tell us a second time. <laughs> so that's how that was. Uh, we had it beyond the ball. Were you close to him when you were growing up? Not very, because I only was close to him when I stayed there that one year for school. But other than that, we weren't close. We'd come to town. My folks would usually bring maybe milk or cream or or maybe some meat for them or sausage or whatever. That was common. And that, so what they survived on, there was no such a thing as pension at that time. So we'd always bring something from the farm, milk and cream and stuff. There was no cow there then. The cows were only there when one of us kids stayed there to go to school. Then they had a cow. Yeah. Did you ever have worked um, in the fields with your father? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was on, on the plow, and that was, uh, we called it we called it a gang plow. We used the f five horses on a plow. We had two of those plows and one single. So there's three plows going there, and my dad would have the drill. We had a lot of horses those days. We had no tractor. We didn't. Uh, my dad didn't get a tractor until after I was married a few years. Then they bought a tractor. Yeah. Other than that, it was just horses. So what what type of farm equipment was on there? You had plows. Well, we'd have. Know. We'd probably have like 300 acres of wheat, and that was all done with horses, and some barley and oats, and uh, that's about, and corn, of course. That was about the extent of it. That's about all. You probably had four to 500 acres altogether, you know, because with horses, you're kind of limited. You know, you can't go out there and work your horses hard all day long. You, you got to take time out for the horses a little bit. Yeah. How many horses were did you have on the farm? Oh, I suppose between 25 and 30. You needed 25 or so every day, it seems, when you're working in the field, you know. Otherwise, you didn't. They're out there in the prairie, you know, just grazing. That's all you did. But we had a couple of teams. We used regular to haul hay from the haystack to the barn or haul the manure out of the barn and... Uh, we need a couple of horses for that all the time. That was all done with, with horses. Did you work the horses in shifts? Well, the only time they worked them in shifts is during harvest. If it was very hot, we would have four horses. My dad would start with four in the morning. Then about nine o'clock, they would switch with two, four others that we had standing in the barn. And that's how you do it. You'd change them every three hours or so, you know, because it, especially when it was hot. They, they had to have their rest, you know, and, so, and water was, was important for them. So with all of the, the, the um, children on the farm, who was responsible for doing the field work? Well, I suppose my dad was, you know, we all worked in the field. We, when they sent us out with a plow, we knew what to do. And you just did it all day long, every day. We do the milking first, you know. Uh, some of us, not all of them didn't milk, but some of us had to do the milking. And then you go take your horses. Well, you'd milk and then have breakfast, I should say. And then you'd go out in the field. And you'd be there till noon and you come back, put your horses in again. And then you, after an hour or so, you go out and hook up again and work them until, let's say, maybe six o'clock or something. So it was a good day's worth of work. Oh, yeah, yeah, it did just work, yeah. What it, type of clothing did you wear out to do the farm work? Just overalls, j uh, the, uh, what do you call those overalls, blue overalls. Uh, what, do you, what do you call that material? Um, denim, yeah, denim overalls. What about shoes? Did you have a good pair of boots? Oh, yeah, and just regular shoes, oh, yeah. In the wintertime, you wore probably four buckle overshoes over them. In cold weather. Hmm. You mentioned that you had um, plows and you had a drill on the farm. Did you have other farm equipment? Yeah, we had discs. Some fields you would just disc and you plow most of it though. 
But sometimes, like the corn ground, we might just use a disc on that. We had two discs, and we needed four horses for each disc. And one, and my, one of my brothers and myself would really be assigned to that disc, to do discs, to do that. And that, uh, they're about uh, six feet long, I guess. Uh, you go round and round till the field is done, you know. Any other type of farm equipment? Well, we had moors to cut hay, and we had rakes to rake hay, and, and uh, whatever else, uh, I don't know. I guess uh, we had those plows and, and this and drill. It's about the extent of it, I guess. Um, your father's name is Alfred, right? Mm-hmm. Did he own the land that Yeah, they owned the land, uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Did he buy it, or did you know if he homesteaded it? Well, they bought that. Uh, when I came around, they had they were on that land already. Prior to that, I think they were renting some land. But uh, they bought that land, and uh, they had at home, we had two quarters and an 80. Then farther out west, we had another three quarters. That was for pasture and for the cattle. And there we had a dam for water. And that gave them their water to drink. And at home, of course, uh, that was mostly grain. And we had other land nearby that we rented to use for barley and oats or something, or corn ground or whatever. So can you tell me a little bit about how the farm was set up? What, what buildings did you have on the farm? Well, of course, we had the regular barn, and that had two side sheds to it. And it had uh, a railing inside. We would pull up a hay with slings. The slings would go into the hay rack, okay? And you put so much hay into it, then you lay another sling. And then uh, you bring that rope down that had a hook on it, and you, uh, you pick up that sling, and the horses would be down below. They would pull that sling from the ro- rope. It goes through the barn, and uh, they walk on out. And when it's up so far, that, that uh, load of hay in that in that bun, that carrier, it would hit the top and then it goes on in. And after it's in, we had a little rope to jerk it open and the hay would fall out. We did that, probably had three of those slings on one load of hay. That's how we handled it. You get it up high and you get it way back to the end. You, you can pull it in there with the rope and then you jerk that little rope that opens it and flies apart. So that was another assignment, you know. Besides the barn? Well, of course, they had. Uh, a, uh, we had a, uh, a straw barn that we built for the uh, range cattle uh, that weren't used for milking necessarily, but uh, they were in a separate corral, and we had this straw barn built. It's just for shelter mainly, and they don't need anything real warm, you know, but uh, they had, a, in bad weather, they needed a little shelter. And we had a couple of granaries and a car shed uh, for the car and the truck. and. Uh, I think that's about the extent of the barns. We had a coal shed next to the house, so our coal was the part to carry for the house. It was heated with coal. We didn't, there was no gas at that time. It was all coal to be used for heating. Where did you get the coal? Oh, they were probably uh, four or five miles away. We'd haul them with a the wagon, and go out there with two wagons early in the fall of the year and haul our coal home. We'd get our winter supply, maybe uh, maybe 20 or 30 a ton, that would carry us through the winter. You mentioned that you had a car and a truck that you, you would have on the farm. Do you remember what type of car you had, what type of truck? Yeah, my, the first one we had was a, 20, a 1925 Chevy Touring, if you know what a Touring is. That is one that wasn't roll-up glass. It was just, it had uh, side curtains were sort of plastic-like, and they snap in. and. Uh, then we didn't have that too long. Then they bought a second-hand 1926. That you could uh, roll up and down. The, the glass would move up and down. Uh, and uh, uh, that was not a very good car, but it really served a purpose. And they had that for quite a few years, and then they bought a, another 1925 model car, and that was better, uh, running better, and a better motor and all that. Those earlier cars were not very dependable. Describe the roads to your farm. What were the roads? Well, like? the roads were just country roads, and in the in the summer, we'd have the county with a scraper. They'd go over maybe once, blade them a little bit, 
but they were still rough. If they had ruts in there from the spring, when it was soft, you'd have deep ruts. Well, you had to live with that until you could blade them a little bit, you know, and get a little better, but they were rough roads. It was all country roads. Yeah, they were not good. Did you ever, um, or did your parents drive the car in the winter time? Oh yeah, when the roads were open, it, when there was too much snow, they couldn't drive the car. Sometimes that car would set for maybe a month or two uh, without turning a wheel. And then we would have to use the horses and, and sled to uh, go to the, uh, uh, to the grocery store or whatever. And if it was even in Mandan, sometimes 20 miles away, you go that far to get your groceries and take the cream to town. Uh, those days, it was always the cream to take to town. You know, when the cans were full, you had to go move it. So can you describe the family home that you grew up in? Well, it was not very fancy. We had no running water. Uh, so the water had to be carried in. I, that was my job evenings to fill a couple of cream cans and on, on a little sled, pull it down to the house and carry it in and fill that boiler you know, on the stove, you know, that uh, whatever. I don't know what you call that container that's on the stove for, for heating water. I'd have to fill that and have the can set on the side if we needed extra water for the evening, we would have it. Well, we had two bedrooms upstairs, and we had, uh, I think, three rooms downstairs, I think. Uh, we, uh, downstairs, we had a dining area, the kitchen, and um, a, small, uh, a small bedroom and a larger bedroom. And upstairs, we had two bedrooms. But us boys, five boys slept in one room. We had two double beds in there and one single. <laughs> and the girls had a, the other room with a couple of double beds in there. You didn't each have a room. <laughs> it didn't work that way. Yeah, we had to double up and get along. And don't complain, that's how it was. <laughs> so what, what, was, what were the mattresses made out of? They were a cheaper mattress, not an inner spring. It was, I don't know what you would call them. Uh, it had a uh, material in there, and they were probably four inches thick or something. It was sort of a wool type thing in there that you're stuffed with. Now, of course, they have good mattresses, but those days they, they were, and we had them as long as, as long as they didn't come apart, we used them. <laughs> yeah. How about sheets? What would you use for sheets? Well, we made regular, they bought those sheets. They used regular sheets, oh yeah. yeah. And pillows? Huh? Pillows? And pillows, oh yeah. The feathers, they made their own uh, feathered pillows, you know. We, uh, they pulled that usually off the geese. When they raised geese, they get those feathers. They were, make the best pillows. They just ripped some of that bottom off, they thin them out on the bottom, and that's how they got their feathers. Any time they were going to kill geese, they'd save those belly feathers. They were better than anything that you, you could have for a pillow. I don't know what they're in there now. I don't know what they're made of. It seems like they're feathers if they want good pillows, I suppose. I don't know. So when you were growing up, what, was it hard for the house to stay warm? Well, that was another one of my assignments to haul the coal in and set it alongside the stove for to use during the night. And uh, it did stay warm. We had a heating stove in the dining area. We had a kitchen range in the kitchen. And we had another heating stove in the living room. So I had to take care of that, take out the ashes in the morning and, and see that they had enough coal for the night. That was part of my job. How about in the winter time, or I mean in the summertime, did it stay Cool in the summertime? Well, it would get on hot days, it gets hot. We had no cooling system of any kind. And we had no fans either. We had no electricity either. So you had to put up with it as it was. If we had a day like this today, this this is what they lived with. You know, that's how it was. Would you sl still sleep two to a bed on hot days like this? Well, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. What type of furniture was in the family home? Well, we had a couch in that had that imitation leather. Uh, I don't know what they called it. Uh, it would uh, peel easy after it got old, you know. Well, we had a couch and we had a, a rocker and a couple of larger chairs. And uh, of course, the kitchen had just the regular chairs and, and, and a bench for behind the table. 
That's all it was. Maybe we had a, a couple of chairs in the bedrooms, nothing fancy. Nothing fancy. It was just, once you bought furniture, it stayed there as long as it stand up. You didn't change. Nowadays, they want to get new furniture, but that, that didn't happen then. You used that as long as you could. It wasn't the habit of buying new furniture. You uh, mentioned a little bit ago that there would be visiting. Did your parents entertain guests often? Not a lot, no. Some of the uncles or aunts would come. Uh, that's about it. There wasn't a lot of it. And you, they would come without any notice, you know, and you'd just fix, fix a meal, you know, and if they come at near meal time, you'd always have enough there for them to eat, you see. Did you have a telephone in your home? Uh, in early years, we had it for a while, and there's one where you do your own ringing, like that with a crank, and that it was sort of a neighborhood thing, and it goes on top of your regular fence uh, next to wire that would carry this telephone line. And uh, then later it was finally discontinued, and they didn't have any all the while I was growing up. That was in the early days, but it served a purpose. They could call somewhere else if they needed a the doctor. They could call to one farm that could call Mandan, you see, and advise the doctor to come out or whatever. But we couldn't call them directly ourselves. We had to call one of the neighbors that could call a doctor, you know. I'm assuming you didn't have running water, so did you have electricity when you were growing up? No, not at all, not while I was growing up. It was just the, uh, we had kerosene lights. So there was no, uh, just all well water, of course, that we had to carry in uh, the best we could. Uh, but uh, we got, we just got used to it without any electric lights. We had those kerosene lamps with a mantle about so tall on there. I think they were a mantle. They would break once in a while, and sometimes they'd start smoking. If they, if your if your fuel was turned up too high, they'd start smoking, and they'd get all black. And then you can turn that down; it'll burn off again in time. But that's how that was. You had to watch that pretty close. We also had a gasoline lamps. They had two little mantles on there, and it was gasoline. They were a good lamp, but you pumped air into that to to maintain the uh, the fuel for it. See. You had to pump air in every time. Maybe even during the time they use it in the evening, pump a little air into it. Yeah. To us, that was a nice lamp. You know, lots. Of, it was bright. What about um, a radio? Did you have a radio when you were growing up? Uh, our first radio was in 1936. We bought a radio. Prior to that, we didn't have any, and. Uh, and that was with a battery outfit, and we would have to take that battery to town to have it charged once in a while in order for us to use that radio. And we'd miss it something terrible while the battery was in town to be charged. <laughs> yeah. But do, you we, remember, do you remember some of the programs that you listened to? Well, we had Little Orphan Annie, and we had Grandma Perkins, old Grandma Perkins, <laughs> one of the soaps, you know. Uh, well, we had. Uh, Oh, I can't think of those comedians that were on. Amos and Andy, they were a common thing. We liked them. They were a lot of fun to listen to, you know. You probably heard of Amos and Andy. Yeah. And the news was always nice to turn on the news. So when you would listen to the radio, is it something that the family would do together? Uh, not, not really. Uh, if it was school time, a lot of them had homework to do, too, you know. And, uh, but there's nothing special. We'd sit there and listen to the radio. It was about the extent of it. And you never had a tractor on the farm when you were growing Not up? Not when I was growing up. That wasn't bought until, I think, about 1942, maybe. And I, we were married in 38, and then we left home. Uh, well, we, I left home before 30. I was 22, 21 when I left home. And then we got married in 1938. And then they bought a tractor, I think about it, uh, I suppose 1942, maybe. I'm going to guess at that. So without electricity and with hot days like this, how would you keep food cool? Well, you wouldn't keep cool. You'd go, we, we didn't have a basement. We had a, we had a, a cellar in the house, but that's, that was not fit to go down to stay. So we just stayed in the shade or out, out of the sun. That's the only way you could keep cool. What would you do if you 
would you do with like milk and, and, and cream on days like this? Well, they had ice to keep milk and cream. They keep cold. Like in the morning, we'd take enough milk away from the regular milk and put it on, on ice and cream the same way. If we need, we needed cream all the time, a little bit. And the milk was always cold, and they made, of course, their own, their own buttermilk and their own uh, sour milk. They made that. That was common. Yeah. You mentioned that um, it was really hot in the in the summer time and really cold in the winter. Did you ever see a um, severe weather like a tornado or a blizzard? Well, we had. I suppose we could have called it a, a tornado. It took down a church that stood on some of our land. It, it was a Lutheran church that the, the wind took down. We would call that a tornado, I guess. Uh, but other than that, we didn't lose any. We had hailstorms where we'd lose a crop now and then. But uh, that's only one time I got determined that as being a, uh, a, a tornado when I took that church down. It, it dropped on our land. It stood on the corner of our land, and this dropped on our land. So they gathered it up and took it out. Uh, you mentioned the hailstorms. Can you describe them a little bit? What were they like back then? Well, the same as you would see hail now. They were about an inch and a quarter in size, like, you know, inch and a quarter in size. And uh, they would damage your crop. What would your dad do when he lost a crop to hail? He'd just get by. If he had a little hail insurance, he'd collect a little from that. And most of the time, they didn't have hail insurance because they needed to spend the money for hail insurance, you know. So, well, they'd have some crop left, they'd just go over it with, they just harvest, harvest it little and not as much as they wanted, you know. That's what they would do, just go over it with what they could. Did that happen often to your father? No, uh, not too much, no. We didn't, we didn't get hailed out too many times. But we got dried out a, t a few times with, with a drought. That happened more times than hail. Yeah, they uh, had poor crops many times, uh, 19... 34 and 1936, there was no harvest. It just dried out. So it wasn't easy, you know. It was, money was so scarce then. And uh, Let's talk a little bit about what the dirty 30s were like for you. Hmm. <laughs> Much of the 30s, of course, that I recall was poor crops. It was uh, very poor. And uh, so you couldn't, if, if you didn't sell any grain, you couldn't buy a whole lot of stuff either, you know. So it, it was a hardship at that time, as I remembered. And the income we had was just the cream that we sold and eggs, of course, we sold them to the grocery store. And that was the only source of in, income when there was no crop to speak of. And when you did have a crop, it might have been a poor crop. Uh, but I recall the one good crop in 1932 was a very good crop. But the price was so poor that you had to sell so much of that crop to pay for the thrash bill. You see, 25 cents a bushel. Can you imagine a bushel of wheat? 25 cents a bushel. By the following spring, though, it was like about a dollar a bushel. See, that would be big bucks then, see? But that, that uh, 1932, for, to have to sell that much grain to pay your thrash bill, that just left you with almost nothing. You needed some money, you had to buy a car when you needed it or whatever, you know. So it, it was not easy. Uh, money was limited. Uh, we couldn't go out uh, somewhere and get any amount of spending money. It just wasn't available for us. Did you ever witness a dust storm during this time? So you would have some, yeah. You'd have some would be dry, no rain for a long time, so you'd have a dust storm, yeah. It, it, uh, Day for days and days it would blow, you know, and, and nothing would grow when there's no, no moisture, you see. So that, you'd have that once in a while. And the 30s was a bad time all around. They just had bad days, it seems. There was never a wet year in those days until later it picked up, you know, in later years. When it got into, uh, towards 1938 and 40, well, it got better. And then you got better crops, you got more rain, and then it have crops almost every year. Right now it hasn't been bad either. In the last number of years it's been pretty good. What about um, um, any type of insect pests? Did, were there... Yeah, we had a lot of grasshoppers. Uh, usually when your grain 
is almost ready to harvest and then be still green a little bit, you'd get grasshoppers and they damage a lot of it. You'd get that. But we, you put up with it, you just harvest, you just have more grasshoppers. <laughs> I remember coming home with a, from harvest when we used the header boxes to cut grain with the header, with a, and that has that elevator that takes the grain up to the header box. Well, then when you come home at noon, for instance, it would be full of grasshoppers on the top part of that header box, and we'd go around with our hands and push them off, and the chickens would go after them. <laughs> they got after those grasshoppers. We had fun doing that. Yeah. Something else I've heard that was really in abundance at that time were jackrabbits. Did you guys have a lot of jackrabbits? Yeah, there were a lot of jackrabbits. In the wintertime, you could get them. In my time, we didn't do much of that, but we did have a lot of jackrabbits around then. But in the summer, my dad used to get the uh, younger jackrabbits, and we'd, he'd, he'd uh, butcher them, and we'd eat those younger jackrabbits. You know, you might say kind of a half-grown. They were good meat then. Right now, I suppose, I probably wouldn't even care for it, but we ate it then, we liked it, you know. It was a change in food, you know, completely. How did he get the younger jackrabbits? Well, you'd have to shoot them with a twenty-two. My dad could throw them with a pitchfork. If you'd see a jackrabbit, he'd throw them with a pitchfork and he'd knock them down, then cut his throat. He could get them like that with a pitchfork, hay fork, yeah. So when you were growing up, did you do any trapping? I did a little bit, but uh, was not successful. Uh, one time, I think I got a skunk, and I didn't appreciate that, and just turned the thing loose. You know? <laughs> did you get sprayed? No, I didn't. No, I think I killed her before she could do that. But uh, uh, I tried to do a little trapping, but I'd, once in a while I get a rabbit in there, or so and that's about it. But uh, nothing big. I was trying to get coyotes. You probably get fifteen or twenty dollars for the. Coyotes hide, but uh, I wasn't that lucky. Were coyotes in abundance when you were growing up? Not a lot, no, but there were some. There were some. They were not, uh, you wouldn't see them too. You'd probably see them in the pasture when you're out gathering your cows or something. You'd see a coyote from a distance. But there weren't a lot of them. Did they ever do any damage to your um, livestock? No, no, not at all. No. Hunting? Did you do any hunting when you were growing I up? I myself didn't. Uh, some some of the young boys did do hunting, but uh, but all I'd ever shoot is a cottontail once in a while. Uh, that's about it. I was I was never a hunter. I liked fishing, but I didn't like hunting. Did yeah. you fish when you were a child? Oh yeah, not not when I was a child. I was I was uh, more so uh, after I was married. I think I did a lot of fishing. I liked it to this day. I like it. I can't get around well enough now to enjoy it, but uh, I, I do enjoy being out. When you were growing up, what type of activities would you do for fun? Oh, probably play ball, softball, uh, a little bit around the yard, that's about all. Uh, sometimes in the neighborhood, uh, on a Sunday afternoon, you might have a ball game going, and you use probably a fairly nice sized fence post for a bat. <laughs> We did. We didn't have a regular bat those days. Just a nice piece of wood to hit the ball with. How about a ball? What would you use for a ball? Well, we we uh, we must have bought it, I suppose, a ball or someone gave it to us or whatever. Yeah. Did you have uh, baseball gloves? Uh, I think in later years you might have had one glove for the family. <laughs> it wasn't big those days at all, you know. Um, what about swimming? Did you ever go swimming when you were a kid? We went to the river. We were never good swimmers, but we did go to the river. We had eight miles. We'd go to it, like maybe on a Sunday afternoon, uh, with saddle horses, and go out there to the river. We enjoyed that. But we weren't good swimmers. We didn't do it too often. Well, occasionally we did, but be on Sunday afternoons. It's about the only time we we could do that. Let's talk about the activities you would do during winter time. Well, like I said, we made our own homemade sleds. You see, we made them out of some scrap lumber, and we had iron straps around there to we nailed to the bottom of the runners, and uh, that would solve the problem for a little sled coming right sliding down our hills. Of course, you pull it back up and slide down and so forth. That was our activity. For maybe uh, after supper, we'd go out there and do that. Uh, when we're through with our chores or whatever, we'd go out 
sliding. And they go, we, we enjoyed that. It was fast time. We thought it was fun, and we, we thought we were lucky to have a sled. <laughs> yeah. What about ice skating? Did you ever go ice skating? No, no, I, I was no ice skater at all. Was there anything else that you would do for fun in the wintertime? We played a lot of cards. We did some of that, yeah. Do you remember any of the card games? Well, we played whist. Whist we played quite a bit. There was these. Nowadays we play pinochle, but then we didn't. We didn't know the game then, but we played whist or rummy or something like that. Yeah. Were there any other type of activities that you would play indoors? Not really, no, really not. Would your parents play with you when you were growing no, up? No, uh -uh, no, they didn't. No, they were no card players. Just us boys. Some of our neighbors would come and we'd play cards that way, or we'd go to the neighbor's house and play cards there. Let's talk a little bit about family and what, what it was like in, in that house with the 13 siblings and your parents. You mentioned um, earlier that your mom died mm -hmm. when you were two months? I was two years old. Or two years. Mm -hmm. Okay. How did she die? She fell in a well and drowned, uh, you know, open well. Yeah, they were careless, had too big an opening. They cooled milk in this well. That's what it was used. It was a, an abandoned well, but they had uh, put milk on a string and left it down into the cold so they could cool milk in warm weather. And then she lost her balance and fell in. And she drowned in there, so, yeah. Was that on your farm? On our farm, yeah. Uh -huh. They were just careless a little bit with having too large an opening. She lost her balance and fell in. What was her name? Catherine was her first name. And she was, uh, I was two years old at the time, and she was 28. Yeah, it was uh, kind of bad, I guess. But I didn't know of it. I still, to this day, I wonder what she was like, you know. It crosses my mind a lot. Yeah. What was her maiden name? Uh, Hopfauf. Yeah, I'm related to the Hopfauf's out around Flasher, Fallon country. That's where they grew up. Did you know her parents at all, your grandparents? I knew the grandma. Her grandma was 90 years old when she died, and the grandpa died at age 56, that Hopfauf grandpa. He had, uh, I think, pneumonia or something, and he died early in life. Your grandmother, what was her name? Do you remember? I'm trying to think. I can't think of it now. I suppose I, I'm lost for thinking of the proper names, you know. So that's fine. I, we, yeah. we know that she's your yeah. your your mother's mother. Um, yeah. You said you did know her. What what was she like when you were growing? Well, up? I liked her very much. She was a likable person, and uh, they could talk old times a little bit from from Russia and so forth, but. Uh, it was interesting to, to listen to, to a few things. I would have listened better today than I did then. It didn't mean too much then, but now I wish I could have conversation with her, you know. But it, it was exciting to listen to her anyway. What type of things would she talk about? Oh, I suppose their farm life or the way they worked in Russia. They uh, had sort of a hardship over there too. They worked for some farmer, I think, over there or uh, whatever. It, it was not an easy life when they finally came to this country. Was your mom born in this country or was she born in Russia? Uh, I kind of think, uh, let's see, they came here in 1893. Uh, she probably was born in, in, in Russia, possibly so. When you would listen to your grandmother talk and tell stories, did she ever tell you stories about your mother? No, not, not really, not really. That story was rarely brought up. My dad would not talk about it. He kind of hushed that. Uh, maybe it wasn't easy to talk about because of the uh, nature of that death, you know. Yeah. Did your, um, who, how old was the oldest child when your, when your mother passed away? Well, I was two, and I suppose uh, my stepbrother was was uh, there then. Uh, let's see. Well, he was six, I think, and I was I was the youngest of five. And I was two years old. Mm -hmm. And your father, his name was Alfred. Uh huh. 
And when you think back, what type of a of a father was he? Oh, I would say he was strict. I always thought so. Yeah. Very strict and uh, not much to uh, have fun with. I couldn't have fun with my dad. A lot of people could, but I, I could not have fun with him. That's not the way it was. It was all business, it seems. And you said he remarried after your mother died? Mm -hmm. Who did he remarry? Uh, a, a Mrs. Knoll, and she had those two boys. And she pretty much raised you, helped raise you? Oh, yeah, yeah. She, I, I uh, respect her as a mother. I didn't know any different. I was two years old, so I fell into that. Uh, she fell into my place, I guess, uh, at that age, and I didn't know any different than she's my mother. I never referred her to her as a stepmother. I just always called her mother. How would you describe her as a mother? This one, you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Canole, how, how was she? Well, she was good. She was a good cook. And uh, she was easy to talk to. I, I liked her pretty well. I would never criticize her. Yeah, she was fine. So when you were growing up, who would do the disciplining if a child stepped out of line? Your mother or your father? Who what? Who did the disciplining if a, if a child stepped out of line? Well, I suppose my dad more so, you know. When he said something, you listened, you know. Yeah, he was pretty strict, I'd say. And if they had to, they'd use a strap, you know, <laughs> if we were a little bit out of line. Do you know how your dad met your stepmother? I really don't know that, uh, how he met. Uh, when... Uh, you married my mother, in those days, you didn't have no long, uh, what do you call a uh, romance going on. You, uh, usually there was a, uh, a guy that would bring them together and arrange that marriage. That's how that was done those days. And I think he knew my stepmother from in Mandan, I suppose, a little bit. Not too well, I suppose, but there was an available woman. So I suppose he went, and she lived in Glendive, Montana, but she was originally from Mandan. And I think uh, that somehow someone mentioned that here's a, a lady that would be available, see. And he needed someone right now, because my dad could not cook at all. He couldn't even boil water. So that's how that was. He had to have a woman. I think he got married to six months after my mother died. Yeah. So was she a German-Russian woman? Yes. Uh -huh. Was she Catholic as well? Yes, she was. Uh, oh, yeah. When you um, think back about your parents, how did they show the, their affection toward the children? How did they show their love? It, it, it didn't show it. They didn't show it. No. <laughs> they didn't show any love for each other. Uh, they weren't very, um, I don't know, what do you call it? Not too devoted, it seemed, but they, they were there for what purpose they were there, I suppose, and they did the cooking and cleaning and whatever they had to do, I guess. But other than that, uh, it wasn't any real love, I didn't think, anyhow. Would they ever hug the children? No, I, I'd never see that. Oh, the, <coughs> they would hug the children when they were little, but, <coughs> but I never saw them hug each other, not at all. Who were you closest to? Well, I don't know. I think I was probably closer to my my right brother, Pete. <coughs> Excuse me. What was uh, Pete like when you were growing up? Well, just normal. I guess I got along better with him. And how close in age was he to you? He was about three years older. What type of things would you do with Pete as a young boy? Oh, you just play together outside a little more, you know. <coughs> After my birthday, us five boys would be uh, like I was two, three, four, five, six. That's how we were in age, because two fell in between there, see. So we were, when, after my birthday, it was two, three, four, five, six. That's how they were. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about school. And what school was like? Mm -hmm. When did you? How old were you when you started school? I guess I was seven. At that time, they had to be seven, and uh, I uh, 
was acquainted with speaking the language because we lived in a Scandinavian neighborhood, so you could follow up with that English language. And many kids, uh, German kids, didn't have a chance to speak English because they weren't exposed to it. But I was exposed to it as I was growing up, even as a young kid, you know. So it, it was quite easy to fall into that. How far was the school from your farm? We had, we had a mile and three quarter to school. And in nice weather, we would walk that all the time. And uh, in colder weather, we would use a horse, buggy, horse and buggy. In the winter time, it would be a sled and uh, two horses. And they had a, a barn to keep horses at the school, you know. We were a mile and three quarter from there. When you were attending school, how many, how many students would, would be at the schoolhouse? At oh, time? between 25 and 30 is how many students they'd have. Do you remember the family names of some of the students? Well, the uh, there's a Rask family and the Carlson family and Swanberg family and uh, and the Helvings and there was a Langang family. Some of their kids, uh, well, the, the, the Langang family was a Catherine and a Margaret and a Jack and an Elizabeth and so on. I, was, I can't think of them, but Mary. Uh, totally can think of right offhand now. The school supplies did you need? What, what, what did you have to bring to school? Well, to uh, the books, they were furnished, you know, whatever. Uh, a reader, and of course, spelling, arithmetic was furnished, and the teacher would explain all that stuff, how you, how you use it, and you'd have tests on that, you know. It was quite simple, though. It was not too thorough. Sometimes we didn't have the best of teachers, but we had some very good teachers. But usually not the best in most cases. Do you remember um, any of the teachers that were really good? Yeah, I, Mrs. Whiffle Johnson was very good. Very good she was. I had her for three years, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And I think I, I did well because of her. And that's as far as I got with education, it's eighth grade only. Uh, most of our family went through the eighth grade. And I think there was one sister one of the younger sisters got high school. Uh, the, uh, I cried and wanted to go to high school. My dad said, there's a lot of kids like you running around in there <laughs> that have high school. <laughs> so he didn't go for it. Well, uh, th there was a problem because where would I stay? I can't be putting down my grandparents all the time and you have to have a place to stay. And it, so it wouldn't work. Did you ever, um, well first, was getting an education was that important to your father? Did he want his children to have They didn't education? care. No, they weren't stressing that too much. They, were, you, they figured as you grew up, if you could sit on a plow and do that, that's what you're for. That's, that's just what it made me think that's what they thought of you, you know? You're here to do that work rather than to have fun or whatever, you know? So they didn't push education too much. I cried and wanted to go to high school, but no. I, well, I suppose it would have been hard for them to stand the expenses too, you see. So, when you were growing up, did you have, did your father ever keep you out of school for work? Not for me. Some of the older boys had to stay out once in a while, but I, I was lucky enough I could go all the time. I, I would never, I'd never miss a day, you know. But the older boys, they had to miss several weeks in the, during the springtime to work, you know. Was that pretty common at that time for students? To it was, that? yeah. They'd have to keep someone home to help with it. Being it was with horses and your seeding time was limited, you're, uh, you, you had to be able to uh, turn that soil over and get that planting done and then you go to school again. So they, they, uh, they stayed home quite a bit, the older boys, two older boys. Do you remember what time school usually started in the morning? Oh, I think it was uh, 9 o'clock. And how long did it usually last? It lasted until, uh, I suppose, 3.30, I would say. What would you do during recess hours? Or, uh, well, in nice weather, we'd have a little ball game going outside or we'd play tag, that type of thing. Nothing that required any amount of expenses, you know, <laughs> that there wasn't such a thing. If it cost money, we didn't do it. Holidays like Christmas, 
and Thanksgiving, how were they celebrated in school? Well, they usually have a school program that they create, you know, and uh, we'd all have parts in, in some plays they might have. They'd give us a part that you had to memorize. We did that, and of course, uh, uh, Thanksgiving, you'd, uh, of course, we were home on Thanksgiving always. We'd have a big, we'd look forward to that big Thanksgiving dinner. That was special for us. And uh, I remember one time we were hauling corn bottles. It was cold weather in November. And Thanksgiving came along, so uh, they had us go out and haul these corn bundles home to the, the stack. And we were so glad to work because we knew we worked a little later and had the meal that after, early that afternoon. And that was the best meal I ever had. <laughs> Being we had to kind of work for it, you might say, you know. We were treated special because we worked a little extra, you know. What was, what did you have for that meal? Turkey, usually turkey, duck, or maybe a goose. For the, for Christmas, um, besides the school program, how else would you celebrate that? I, well, the family do? They, they would draw names, the kids would draw names amongst themselves to, to buy gifts for, for, um, for whoever name they draw boy or girl or whatever. And other than that, they, they would have that regular school program, you know, and, and a group of kids would take part in that, in those plays. But you didn't, they didn't spend much money for, for gifts. I'll tell you what I got one time. I had a guy's name, and there's a picture of a Santa Claus out of a catalog, just a picture. So he cut that picture out and made a hole in it, and, he, and it held two pencils. <laughs> Two nickel pencils, that was my gift. <laughs> they didn't go for big bucks, I'll tell you. <laughs> Not those days. That was unusual. That was rare. You know, it was, looked so skimpy, it was terrible, but it's what some did, you know. <laughs> How about at home? Did the parents give the kids gifts for Christmas? Well, they, not so much gifts. We would get like nuts and candy and they'd put it out on the table in the evening for those kids, you know, and we would have a big treat with that. Uh, walnuts, peanuts, and whatnot, and, and, and candy. That's it. But as far as gifts, not too much, uh, uh, as we were young anyhow. Not very much. What about a Christmas tree? Did you have a Christmas tree? We'd have tree? a Christmas tree once in a while, you know. We had the, uh, the uh, wax candles on it, of course, for lights, you know and we'd have to watch it very closely when they burned down because they were a hazard as well, you know. So uh, since there was no electricity, you had to have those candles. candles. We'd just light them for a little while, maybe half hour or something, and then blow them out again. Um, what about, let me see. What about um, Santa Claus? Was he a big deal back then? Well, we had some guy dressed as Santa, maybe had just a mask or something, and he would have a bag of little gifts, perhaps, nothing fancy, and maybe peanuts or nuts or something. That's about the extent of it, you know. Yeah, it was very simple. And uh, in school, of course, we'd do names uh, at Christmas time and to buy a little something like quarter or whatever, you know. <laughs> the church? What would church do for Christmas? Well, they'd have their Christmas Eve on Sunday, on the Christmas Eve, they have ma special mass, you know, and uh, otherwise just the normal, the regular Christmas singing type of songs. That's about all I can tell you on that. We talked a little bit about Thanksgiving, but what about Valentine's Day? How was Valentine's Day? Well, that was Day? just skipped altogether, yeah. In school, they probably pass around a few little valentines or something, but on a very small scale, nothing great at all. Now, some schools were different, I suppose. How about um, one thing that I've heard quite a bit about is names days. Was that celebrated when you were growing up? Not a lot, no. Mine wasn't celebrated much. It was not a common name. But uh, the older folks, like St. John's, that was after Christmas, uh, that was celebrated with them. And uh, maybe uh, a 
couple more uncles who was a common name. They celebrated those some. They'd have people in for dinners or whatever. But for our kids, they were, uh, I suppose once in a while my mother would make a cake, you know, for his birthday or her birthday or whatever. So birthdays yeah. were celebrated. Yeah. What type of cake would your mom bake for? Usually, usually flat cake. <laughs> yeah. And with a little frosting on it so that it looked look right. Was she a good, did she do those uh, uh, well? Well, she, uh, she was a good cook. I liked her for her cook. I had good meals. They were tasty meals, too. What about Fourth of July? How was that celebrated? Um, we, uh, in those days, we didn't have no rodeo going on like they do today. Now they have a lot of rodeos in our town. But uh, back then, uh, they didn't, uh, there was hardly no celebration going on. I'd hear some of those farmers say, well, on the 4th of July, I hope we get a good rain. You know, that's what they looked forward to. They didn't care to celebrate 4th of July much. Firecrackers, rarely did we have any money for firecrackers. It'd be just a little bit of all. Uh, maybe a little cap gun, you know, was our entertainment for 4th of July. What about Easter? How was that celebrated? Oh, in a very similar way. We have Easter Sunday, and uh, uh, I suppose you'd have a special meal, usually, and we'd go to church that day. And other than that, it was just normal, I guess. Nothing, no great celebration. Did they ever color eggs or anything? We like did. That? We uh, we dyed some eggs, and we had that. Yeah, that was always kind of interesting. It would make Easter look like Easter when you did that. You see, you know. Yeah. So we did that. Uh, the girls usually did that. My uh, sisters, they did more of that. Um, what about? Would there ever be like some type of? Gathering for harvest or a celebration in honor of the of harvest or crops? No, not a gathering for that at all. No. There was enough of us in our own family to to do the harvest work. You see, so we didn't need any neighborhood help for the thrashing. We do it. We had the neighborhood help. You know that we would. One of my uncles had a thrash machine, and we used the neighborhood around there to help, and then. Uh, if someone would help us, we'd have to help them back another time when they were doing some special work. There wasn't much money exchange, you just go help them back. <laughs> yeah. So, were, since you had 13 kids in your family, were any of the, the children hired out to other farms? Well, I was a lot of times. Work on another farm for a while. And if there was any money coming, well, my, that went to my dad, you know. I, we didn't get much money working there either. Yeah, I did that a number of times. What type of work would you have to do when you were hired? Oh, out? I'd milk the cows in the morning and evening and probably sit on the plow. If it was harvest time, I would do some shocking, shocking grain. It was not a picnic by no means, but it was normal work that you would do on a farm. Would you ever stay over at their houses or would you come back in the evenings? Well, or? as a rule, we'd stay there maybe for a week or two if we were hired out or maybe longer sometimes. And if we, end, if we were there just for thrashing time, then we'd go home to our house for us to sleep, you know. We wouldn't stay there and sleep them all because we have enough at home that needed sleeping. <laughs> Do you know when you were hired out about how much they paid your father for that work? Oh gosh, maybe 10 or $12 a month or something. Yeah, not much. And then did they take care of your room and board while you were sleeping? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that hard for you to stay with different families? No, not really, no. They had big families too. Most of them had big families. We were used to, used to a lot of people around. Did your father ever have a hired, hired man? Yes, he did. He, uh, he had uh, uh, my uncle work for him for many years. And uh, at harvest time, he would hire some guy that he'd pick up in town that come out and shock grain. We were younger. So they'd hire this guy, and he probably got like, I think, uh, seems to me like six dollars a day for uh, shocking the grain. But we would help him, you know. We were young yet; we couldn't 
do a man's work for sure, but we could help him. But he was a good worker. When at six o'clock he quit in the evening. He did so many hours and he quit, but he, he worked all day long. He was a good worker. You mentioned that you got married in 1938. Mm -hmm. How did you meet your wife? We had no actual meeting. I just knew who she was from going to the same church. So I knew who she was, and that's how we started dating in time. And, uh, and we were married in 1938. And then uh, next year, if we live long enough, we'll be married 70 years, <laughs> June 6th. If we live that long, yeah. Oh my goodness! Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Yeah. Not too many of it that hang on that long <laughs> to the same wife. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, yeah. It'll be. I hope we make it to that day anyhow. To celebrate our seventieth a little bit, just have a little family gathering, I suppose. Well, you said that you 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 would you dated for a little bit. What was dating like when you were growing up? What would you do? Well, just go to a dance. That's all. That's about all we did. If I could get the car, I'd get to the dance. And uh, I would probably write her and say, I'll see you Saturday, if I can get the car. You don't always get it, you know. So that's how that was. It was never definite, you know. Yeah. So where would the dances be held? Well, they would be in, in Mandan and Flasher. That also was 20 miles to Flasher and 20 miles to Mandan. So we'd go there to dances occasionally. And St. Anthony, the, where we went to church, they would have an occasional dance there. That was the extent of our entertainment. Uh, so you know. what, what were dances like back then? Similar to what they are now, waltzes and polkas and that kind of stuff. We, we enjoyed doing that. To, to us, that was fun. Did they have an accordion player or yeah. a band? They, or? they'd have a small band, maybe accordion and a drum usually. No big band, they couldn't afford them. Would you take her out to dinner before or? No, we didn't go to dinner. So that's, it didn't always work out. We'd go after supper, if I get the car, then we'd go to that dance, but not to dinner as much. We just didn't in those days. Now I would, of course, but those days, he didn't go to dinners. Not really. Was there an entrance fee in to get into the dances? On, on some of them, there would be like 50 cents a person or something, you know. And most of that went towards the, the music that had to be paid. Were there beverages served? No. Not really. No liquor served there either. We weren't great on having liquor because we uh, knew it was wrong if we got into trouble and having liquor. So uh, we were kind of pretty soft on liquor. What about um, a theater or a movie house? Were there a movie house in Maine? Yeah, yeah they, had, they had a couple of theaters. We went to that just on rare occasions, not very much. I don't think I took her to more than a couple of movies during that period. Where, what town was that in? Mandan. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any of the movies that you No, not, not really. Huh? Um, how long did you date before you got married? Oh, maybe a year and a half or something, I would guess. And can you tell me a little bit about your wedding day? Well, what shall I say? We had uncles and aunts invited and some young people. And uh, well, my grandma was around yet. She came, gave me a big hug on my wedding day. <laughs> and uh, other than that, it was, there they used to serve drinks. Uh, they call it red eye, that red eye liquor. They pass around the bottle and they all drink out of the same glass, you know. That's how they poured it. <laughs> That's how the habit was. You didn't have your, your regular glass all evening. You didn't get that. You come around with a shot glass, give you a little drink and go to the next guy. And also what they did during uh, wedding dances, they, um, they paid as they danced. They, uh, they would say, no pay, no play. Uh, you'd have to pay for a dance with, with whatever girl you danced with. You, go give the musician maybe 50 cents or a dollar or a quarter or whatever. That's what they, how they got by. Not every wedding was done that way, but ours was. If you paid them as you danced, yeah. Was the wedding an all-day event? Yeah, you had the, the noon meal and the evening meal. Two, two big dinners. And who prepared the meals? 
Well, they'd have some lady uh, from the uh, church, I suppose, that was, they're familiar with, did the cooking. They cooked the meals. But my dad killed a, a beef and we furnished the meat that way. We shared it with, with my wife's family and uh, that way they had a lot of beef for their meal. Roast beef, I suppose, I'd call it. Um, do you remember what church you were married at? St. Anthony. That's where we went to church there and we got married there. Do you know who officiated over the ceremony? Uh, 1938. I don't know if we had that same priest or not. Eh? I think probably Father Andrew, I imagine, uh, could have been. I, I might be wrong on that. Okay. Did you wear a suit? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Suit and white shoes. White shoes? <laughs> it was just the habit, I guess, of ours that we did. We don't do it all the time, but we had white shoes. So, um, what is your wife's name? Her uh, regular name is Magdalene, but we call her Maxie, M-A-X-I-E. When she went to grade school, her teacher said, your name is too long, we have to cut that down. So they made it Maxie, M-A-X-I-E. But of course on business paper, we can't do that. We have to use her regular name. And what is her maiden name? I mean, her maiden name was Morel. Yeah. So is she German Russian? Yes. Uh huh. And was she Catholic? Yes, she was. So were your were your parents pretty happy with your choice in a in a wife? I guess so. Uh -huh. <laughs> what about um, World War Two? In 1941, Pearl Harbor was bombed. Do you remember when you first heard about that? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we were married and had a child when that happened, when war broke out. I'm sure I would have been drafted, you know, if, but we were deferred a little bit because we had a child and also I worked on the railroad. They needed me for transportation purposes and that kept me out a little bit. But pretty soon I, we had bought a house and then when this came out, I decided to sell the house because I was classed in A1 for the service. And I, I knew I'd be called real soon. Well, it turned out that I wasn't called. And then I didn't have to go into the service because of the fact where I worked, I suppose. And by that time, the war was over, see. But I, I was thinking I'd be drafted, it, I was so sure. That's why I sold that little house that we had. I didn't want her to have to sit back there and take care of a yard, you know. Was that a pretty stressful time for you guys? Yeah, it was, uh -huh. yeah. Well, let's ask some concluding questions and we can kind of wrap this up. Mm. Um, when you think back to your childhood, what is one of your, one of the scariest experiences you had? From the family, I mean. Well, if someone got very sick at home, that bothered me a lot. Yeah. My brother went over to the neighbors one night with a horse and buggy to, to get something or bring something home, I forget. <coughs> and somehow the horses jerked and it threw him over the top of the, of the front of the buggy and he hit his head on the, on the pole and put quite a cut in his head. So he had to be taken to the doctor quickly. <coughs> but he came out of it after a week or so in the hospital. Uh, but that's one thing that scared me. It, it really hurt me to think that he got hurt that bad. He was bleeding heavy when he came into the house. He walked home and the horses run away. See, when he come home, the horses were there too. But he come walking home, he was about a mile and a half from home. <coughs> so those things bothered me a lot. Which brother was this? Pete, my older brother. Yeah. And how old were you when that happened? Oh, I suppose about uh, 12, 14 maybe. 
<coughs> what about um, one of your happiest childhood memories? Hmm. I just don't know what I should say to that. When you get together at a Christmas time or something, it was kind of almost enjoyable. Everybody was home pretty much. Of course, as the years went on, you know, some of us scattered. My older brothers scattered, and Pete, Pete worked for somebody else maybe. Pete got married after I did, and uh, John eventually was in the service. Joe was in the service. See, so the, the family kind of scatters after that. And uh, I have a sister who got married a year after I did, and they left. You know, that's how it went on and on. Your two brothers that were in the service, did they make it back okay, or did they have to serve overseas? They were um, both overseas. John was in the South Pacific, and Joe was uh, in, in Germany, I guess. And they made it back okay. Joe, Joe had an injury, but he was all right. It wasn't bad. So they both made it home okay. Yeah. How about when you think back to, the, to your childhood years, Something that you consider an adventure. Did you ever have an adventure as a young boy? Something you thought was kind of out of the ordinary? Something unusual? Yeah. I don't know what the heck to give you on that, uh, for sure. Hmm. I can't think offhand what I should give you on that. Giving a new car was something <laughs> we like to see. <laughs> That's about it. That was about when we had the 1925, we had a Chevy, and then 1926, they got that later, a few years later, was in 1926. But it was kind of nice to, to feel of having a car, you know, in, in being in a new car. Other than that, there was nothing much. All kind of on a small scale. <laughs> Low key, let's say. Huh? <laughs> Is there anything else about your childhood years that you'd like to add that we didn't discuss? No, I can't think of anything right now. Okay, I have one last question for you, oh. and that is, why did you decide to participate in this interview today? Well, I suppose because I was asked to, <laughs> if I would, I don't know. And I don't know if I did good or not, but uh, I thought, okay. I thought maybe I shouldn't do it, I wasn't sure. <laughs> well, you did just fine, you did oh. fabulous. So oh, this has been great. We thank you. Oh.